I welcome you all in this live stream preaching today, uh, this afternoon. Uh, indeed, this is the third preaching in the series of preachings regarding uh, the need for marriage proposals, taking Christian youth friendship to the next level. There is a need for marriage proposals. There is a need to take Christian youth friendship to the next level. It is an important topic for parents, for children, for our youth in particular. It remains our prayer, wish, and hope that God will help us to raise our youth for the Lord. Because parents, children, youth, always cry, pray, wish, and hope that God will help them to have a blessed and good life. To have, especially the youth, to have life partner, faithful life partners good and sustainable marriages and have a blessed families obeying children in future who will grow in the Lord. That is a wish, a cry, a, a hope, a prayer of every parent and youth. Because good marriage and family is like a fountain it's like a well. It's like a spring with cold water for the church and for the society and nation in general to drink from. You will agree with me that godly marriage and family have a lot of influence and impact on the church of God and on the nation in general. We cannot talk about the healthy church or society without talking about the healthy relationship, courtship, marriage, and family. Because the healthy church, the healthy nation, is built by the healthy marriage proposals, marriages, and families where children and youth are raised indeed in the Lord. And for this reason, it is our prayer, our wish and expectation that you will find these teachings useful and helpful in your struggle as a parent, doing your parenting responsibilities and in your struggle as as youth, in your youth challenges in the 20s and those in the 30s and those in the 40s, maybe even late 40s. We ask God, we should ask God to be the one who will speak with us, with all of us, each and every one of us. And before we open God's word from various texts regarding this teaching, let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this afternoon. We just want to exalt your holy name. To glorify you. You are holy, holy, holy God Almighty. We come before you also to thank you for the time, the privilege that you are giving us. That we can listen to your word as parents who have challenges to raise our children in the Lord 
as our first responsibility before you. And also to address our beloved youth in their 20s, 30s, and 40s some of whom retired already on this race, some of whom gave up, some of whom are not even attempting, not even praying for life partner, for marriage, for family. They are living and not minding about how to find a life partner, how to prepare their attitude and their view concerning it. And we are praying, dear Heavenly Father, that you be with us, you be with our children, you be with our youth, so that this issue remains on the table. This issue remains on the heart. Because what we know is, it was not Adam who started it. It was you who instituted marriage and who saw it that Adam will need a life partner. You have promised that when we knock, when we ask, when we come to you, you will answer our prayers as our Father. Based on that, on your promises, we ask you, and we are coming to you, dear Heavenly Father. Just be with us and help us, even with this teaching. Just reach all our youth, all the parents who are out there, who are making this plea, who are crying unto you how to raise children, how to do the parenting in a responsible biblical way. And all the youth who are out there in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, maybe late 40s, we are making this plea. Just be with your children wherever they are so that they come to the fold, so that they don't give up, so that they can depend and rely on you because we know you are our faithful God. And you listen to our prayers. Even responding and giving us more than we prayed for and expect. Because you never cease to surprise us. In Christ we pray. Amen. I am so glad. I am so glad to be before you. And before God, talking about this topic, the need for marriage proposals. Because indeed, there is a lack of marriage proposals. And we, we are going to address the issue of attitude, the issue of views towards life partner. Because there is a connection, there is a, a link between your view concerning marriage, marriage proposal, and your, your life in general, and your calling in general. There are a link, there is a connection between that. And this connection is so important that it must be addressed. It must be clear. How should youth have a clear view, a clear attitude concerning 
a life partner. Also, their approach concerning proposals. How should they listen to proposals? And how should they propose? Because it is very important. So today, I will concentrate on seven youth, seven characters who are Christian or who are people of God, youth of God, given gifts, blessed by God, singled out in their own families, in their own communities, as role models, called by God himself. So we'll concentrate on these seven youth, but what you will see is they were blessed, they were singled out by God, they were gifted, and they have mission in their lives. They were youth with mission. But now, their marriages were affected because their view of marriage, their view of life partner was wrong and it affected their lives, their CV, their profile and God's work in general was affected. They could have done more. They had potential to do more. But what led them, some of them, to their downfall? That God's work, what was at stake, is only that by His grace, they were lifted up from their mistakes. God's work continued, but it was affected dearly. Who are they? Simpson, one. David, two. Solomon, three. Jehoshaphat, four. Jehoram, five. Six. Ahaziah, seven. Ezekiel. I will talk about these seven. Simpson. Samson in Judges 13, you can read verse 24 and 25. A blessed man, a gifted man with power. And the Holy Spirit was with him and empowered him so that he can be prepared to do God's work, which even their parents, his parents, could not figure out how he will do it. Judges 14, verse 4. He was so gifted. But the mistake he did was taking a wrong decision concerning girls. He was a young man with a lot of potential, but because of wrong view of girls, he misused his power he misused his position and took a wrong decision concerning girls. When we read Judges, Judges 14, verse 1 to 4, I'll just read. The word of God says, Samson went down to Timna and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timna. Now get her for me as my wife. His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all? Our people, must you go to the uncircumcised Philistine to get a wife? But Simpson said to his father, Get her for me. She is the right one. For me. Though 
This Philistine girl is uncircumcised. The Philistine themselves, uncircumcised. Uncircumcised meaning that they are not part and parcel of God's people. The sign of it is circumcision. Like in the New Testament, baptism. To show, to indicate that you have accepted God as your God. You fear God. Your whole life submit to God's rule, to God's law, to God's word. You are a child of God. So they were not circumcised. And he said to his parents, who accepted Samson as their child, as a gift from God, and raised him. And they are saying to him, Go to the pool of God's people. Go to the pool. There is a scope. There is a pool of God's people where you will find girls amongst the people of God. And Simpson said, no. Simple, no. I want her, no matter what. You can read the history. You can read how many girls he proposed and things didn't work out. And it affected his life and his calling. So your life is affected, you like it or not, by whom you want to marry and whom you propose, to whom you uh, listen to concerning proposals. Who should propose you? Who, are, who is the one whom you propose? Your decision on that regard affect your life, affect your calling, affect your CV, affect your profile, affect your personality, affect everything about you. That is the first thing. Secondly, David in 2 Samuel, chapter 16, verse 11 and 12, uh, we get David, who did adultery with Bathsheba and compromise the good profile compromise his life and kingdom from 2 Samuel chapter 12 13 onwards his kingdom God's work was affected his family in particular was affected he was the man whom Samuel chose in first samuel chapter 16 verse 7 you will see that there god said he don't choose because of appearance god check look at the inside from the inside out not at the height and appearance in acts 13 Verse 22, I have found David a man after God's heart. He will do all, everything I want him to do. Acts 13, verse 22. In Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. David was chosen by God himself, not by Samuel. In Acts 13, verse 22, I have found a man after my own heart. He loved God, loved David. But his view, his action affected his kingdom and his calling. And it was recorded. 
The reason why uh, we are saying this is because it is recorded. It is there for you and me to see. As parents, we are responsible to mention this because it is there. Life will not, never be the same indeed. Yes, restored David. Uh, he was restored. Psalm 51, Psalm 32, he cried so that he can be restored. But life will never be the same. David could say that. By decision, which one takes? Regarding whom you propose, which proposal you accept, concerning uh, marriage, it affects your CV, and it affects your calling, it affects your life. Three, Solomon. The Bible says, 1 King 3, 12, he was given wisdom and discerning heart so that when you check the past, his contemporary and the future, no one match his wisdom and discerning spirit and heart. 1 King 3, verse 12. He was above the rest concerning wisdom. Like Samson, he was having power above the rest. But Solomon did a terrible mistake. Yes, his name is Solomon, making peace. Yes, to make peace by making alliance. Marriage alliance, alliance which is based on marriage, where he will marry women of other nations, girls of other nations. First King 3 verse 1. First King chapter 3 verse 1. He made alliance with Egypt, married a daughter of Pharaoh. And it was a trend throughout. Where in chapter 11, 1 King 11, 1 to 9, you will see the analysis, the commentary about his rule. Yes, it was a flourishing time. It was good time. The time of David and Solomon was a climax of all the time of Israel's kingdom. It was a glorious moment. But things which affected the kingdom was marriage. Was mixed marriages which led to mixed worships. Mixed worship, mixed marriages affected the kingdom dearly. The Bible is not shying, is not hesitating to mention this. Why? Because Marriage is important in the Bible. For Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 3 and 6, you will hear a commentary in 2 Chronicles chapter 17, 3 to 6, you will hear a summary of how good Jehoshaphat was he started good he was a good king he even made a decision that he won't do what his father did at his late stage asa was a good king indeed in second chronicles 16 verse 7 he made a mistake asa made a mistake of mixed or of alliance with syria that was the mistake which he did. And Jehoshaphat corrected that. He was a good king. But he also made a mistake. He made an alliance with Ahab and Jezebel. He made a visit 
and Ab entice him to make an alliance with the Israelites, the Jewish and the Israelites. You must remember, after Solomon, Rehoboam, who is the son of Solomon, left with Judah and Benjamin as tribes. Then, Yerobeam went with ten tribes and Ephraim was the capital city by then. And Bethel was used where they worship idols. So now, these ten tribes continue to do wrong, to worship idols. Prophets were sent, but they didn't repent. Even in times of Ahab, it was even worse because Jezebel was a foreigner. And she made sure that there are prophets, false prophets in Israel. By the time of Elijah, there were 400 prophets and priest of Baal. So you can imagine the Israelites led by false prophets of that number. So now, Jehoshaphat, a good king, knowing all this, he made alliance with Israelites. And the worst part he led Jehoram, his son, to marry Atalia, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. And Yehu rebuked that. You can read 2 Chronicles 18 verse 2. That was the alliance of Ahab and Jehoshaphat. In 2 Chronicles 19, verse 2, you will see Yehu rebuking Jehoshaphat about this alliance and about that marriage, that, that square pass, that champagne pass, where the father made alliance with Ahab and Jezebel and get Joram, a wife by the name of Atalia. Five, Joram himself, the son of Jehoshaphat. In Second Chronicles 21, verse 13, Elijah's letter, by then Elijah was dead or was taken to heaven. We remember uh, that incident. He was already taken. But his letter, his word, which remained, was read to Jehoram. And he was rebuked because he was not a child. Even though his father made an alliance and get him to get married to Atalia, he was responsible. And the reason was mentioned in 2 Chronicles 21 verse 6 that he walked according to the ways of the Israelites of the ten tribes of Ahab and Jezebel. And it was mentioned that it was because he married Atalia as a reason why he was not a good king because of marriage. Six, Ahaziah, the grandson of Jehoram, Je Jehoshaphat, and the son of Jehoram, the son of 
Atalia, the grandson, of course, of Ahab and Jezebel. In 2 Chronicles 22, verse 2, it was clear, it was mentioned that due to the fact that his mother was Atalia, it affected his kingdom, his rule, his kingship. Because Atalia made sure that she taught, she taught him the ways of the Israelites, the ways of Ahab and Jezebel, and he followed those ways. So, when you read Kings, when you read Chronicles about the kings, the reason was stated clearly that either a king is a good king because of the good mother and the good wife. Or the king is a bad king because of the bad mother and the bad wife chosen. That's why I want to end this by Ezekiel. Ezekiel, uh, 2 Chronicles 29, verse 1 and 2. He was a good king because of the mother Abia, the daughter of Zachari Zachariah, the priest, and did good and followed the ways of David. And it was stated because of the mother, uh, the daughter of Zachariah. It is very clear. Uh, I just skip other kings. You can go on and read and made your own conclusion. I just took these seven and I skip others. The point here is clear. A good king and a bad king. Uh, the goodness and the badness uh, is due to a good mother, a good wife. Uh, if you have a bad mother, a bad uh, wife, it influences, it impacts your life and your CV and God's calling is affected by that. So the Bible is making this noise is making this plea, is saying to the parents, this is serious. This is important. As a parent, we must have this view. Jehoshaphat affected the kingdom. You can read Jehoshaphat's life from First Chronicles chapter 16 or 17 to 22 and onwards, you will see how nearly the kingdom of Judah was nearly affected because of the wrong decision of a parent making square pass and affecting generations because it was not only what he decided to his son, Jehoram. It affected Ahaziah and also other children, other generation in future. We don't have time to go on uh, about that. So whatever you decide now, as a parent for your child, how you pray for your child, how you raise your child, and also how you address the issue of marriage. It is very, very important. Not only to your generation, but it affects your grandchildren in future. And that's why I want to end this by Proverbs. In Proverbs 31, you will see there the life of the king 
King Lemuel, king of Massa, the kingdom of Massa, somewhere in northern Arabia. He was influenced and taught by his mother. Like in Proverbs, mother, child, uh, father, child, uh, parenting is very important in Proverbs. Whether we talk about the father to the children, mother to the children, it doesn't matter. But the issue is parenting is very important. But in this part, in Proverbs 31, verse 1 to 3, I want to concentrate on verse 3. Proverbs 31, 1 to 3. The saying of King Lemuel, an oracle his mother taught, uh, taught him, O oh, my son, O oh, son of my womb, O oh, son of my vows, do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who ruin kings. I want to focus on verse 3. Do not sp spend your strength. You see, your calling, your profile, your CV, what you fought for, what you were given, what you were blessed with. Imagine if this message is going to Samson. If this message it goes to David, to Solomon, to Jehoshaphat, to Joram, to Ahaziah. If the watch can be rewinded, the watch of life can be rewinded and they can be given a chance to start again. This message of mother of Lemuel, the king of Massa, he is saying, do not spend, do not spend, do not sell your personality, your life, what you were given, the treasure you have, the CV, the profile, the blessings that you have, your life on women, plural, women. They ruin kings. And that was the exercise which we did here. We only made an example of the few, but there are many. Ruined by their view of a woman. Then he went on. She went on in verse 10. The mother of Lemuel went on and make this a challenge and a question. In verse 10, a wife of noble character, who can find? Who can find a woman, a wife of a noble character? She is worth far more than rubies, more, more than treasure itself. More than wealth, more than silver or gold, to have a wife of noble character worth more than all material pleasure. Many can testify about this, and these kings can testify about it, as we have seen. But now, she asked the question, and she answered it. Uh, I don't want to go on verse 11 up to uh, verse 28. But I want to read uh, from verse 13. Actually, verse 13. Charm is deceptive. 
and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Your standard, King Lemuel, my son, your standard should be a woman, a wife who fear the Lord. That is your standard. That is how you gauge. That is how when you are saying, I want a wife, that is how you measure a wife. In Proverbs 8, verse 13, it is very clear there, uh, defining what is to fear the Lord. Verse 13, Proverbs 8, verse 13. To fear the Lord is to hate sin, to hate pride, to hate arrogance, to hate evil behavior, to hate perverse speech. I want to concentrate on hating evil. The opposite is to fear the Lord is to love good, to do good, to follow God's leading, to follow God's word, to obey God's ruling, to walk in the ways of the Lord. You won't make a mistake when you find somebody who believe in God, who follow and obey God's law and rule, because such a person have a roof, have someone who will guide, who will protect the whole family because of the fear of the Lord. That is the standard. I want to end this by going to Genesis 24. I just want to put the challenge to you. We are going to deal with this scriptural portion in our other teachings regarding this. Because remember, we only dealt with the negative part. Who are the youth who did right before the Lord? Who chose right? But here, I just want to end this by um, summarizing the parent's resp responsibility before the Lord. You can listen to what Abraham did for Isaac. Uh, opposite to what Jehoshaphat did. Genesis 24. When you have time, you can read the whole uh, chapter. I just want to read a few. Abraham was now old and well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the chief servant, in his household, the one in charge of all that he had. Put your hand under my thigh. I want you to say by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son, from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I'm living, but you will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son, Isaac. I just want to, to read verse 12. To 14. You see, he was giving, given this assignment. It's a difficult assignment. Old man Abraham, he knew that he's going to die, but he ought to make a vow to swear 
by the Lord that he will never, he will not do it to get a wife from the Canaanites. You know the reason. The faith is important. Then this servant, this chief servant, you see, to show that he has something, he knew something about God. In verse 12, he prayed. That is the matter. He prayed. I'm putting this as a challenge to you. You can be a youth in your late 30s or 40s. Maybe you have retired from this race. Maybe you, you, you are saying it is done, I'm, I'm, I'm done. You don't even go to uh, preachings and teachings concerning love, courtship, and marriage. You even joke about it. It is not a joking matter. It is a serious matter. It affects your life. Even when you decide not to do it, it will affect you. It affects your profile. It affects your relationship with God. As long as you are still having heartbeat, as long as it is still there and you knew it, you know it that God has something with you. Take this. This servant of Abraham he prayed. Listen to his prayer. Genesis 24, 12. Oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, give me success today. He is not saying it is Abraham who will do so. He is saying, oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing be, beside this spring and the daughters of the town, uh, townspeople are coming out to draw water. You see, how, how will he know? That is the question. That's why he's praying. 14. May it be that when I say to a girl, please, let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink, and I will water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this, I know, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Then when you go to 33, I'll read 32 and 33. So the men went to the house and the camels were unloaded. Straw and fodder were brought for the camels and water for him uh, and his men to wash their feet. Then food was set before him. But he said, I will not eat until I have told you what I have, I have to say. He was so happy because God fulfilled the promise he himself made that, you know, uh, uh, Jesus put it very clear that you know we uh, in Matthew 7 he put it very clear uh, that we should pray verse 7 Matthew 7 verse 7 ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. 
He who seeks, find. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Listen to the reasoning. Which of you, if his son ask for bread, will give him a stone? Ten. Or if he ask for a fish, will give him a snake? If you, listen, if you, then, though you are evil, eh, knows how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven gives good give, gifts to whom? To who ask him? Remember, remember, it was not Adam. It was no, not Adam's idea. It was always God's idea that you find a life partner. It was always God's idea, never your idea. So, don't undermine God. He will never cease to surprise you. Don't undermine God. In Genesis 2, verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good, it is not good for a man to be alone. I will make the helper suitable for him. And you see, verse 19, downwards until verse 20, he let Adam do whatever he is assigned to do. He got a work. He must do it. But down there, in verse 20, the last part, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. He wants you to realize in your day-to-day -day work that you need him. You need God. And when you realize that indeed I miss something in this life and you put it to God in prayer, you must just now relax. As long as you have that need and you put it to God in prayer and you let God be God, what will happen is the same as this. It's only when you, you have made that indication. Verse 21 and 22. Genesis 2. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of man's rib and closed up the place with the flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. The passiveness and the activeness. God is active. Even in this world, even in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s, he remains active. Just indicate, just plea, just cry, just ask and put him as God. Show that you honor him as God. You are not praying a, a prayer which is a tired prayer, which is a doubtful prayer, but you are praying knowing who God is, his name, his rule, his will, and he is active. That is for sure. And he will work while you are asleep, while you relax. And God, in his time and timing, will provide. May the Lord be with you. Uh, thank you. We'll find each other in other uh, teachings of this, uh, um, on this topic. Amen.